Hello. It's been a while. Democracy. Elections. Voting. Voting is the exercise of political power. Some people don't vote or have less power in their vote than you do. You are thereby exercising authority using force. And force is violence, the supreme authority from which all other authorities are derived. My beloved constituents, my name is Joseph John Donald Robinette Triban Jr. Sr. to third junior, and it has come to my attention that some of you are misinformed. Some of you say that you are not going to vote for me because of silly little things like supporting war crimes and human rights abuses. Don't let a thing like that stand in your way when you go to the polls. Do not let your morals influence you at the voting booth. I've brought you record employment, a booming economy, lowered inflation, and all while keeping our climate a top priority. And besides, if you think I'm bad, you haven't seen the other guy. That guy is a threat to our very democracy, the foundations of our entire world. Since ancient Greece, we've cherished the opportunity to defend the rule of many, collective power over our society, unless you have a job. And now that other guy is threatening all of that, unless you go out and vote. I, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. <laughs> this year, more people than ever before in history will go to the polls in the same year. Elections for European Parliament, the Indian Lok Sabha, and the President of the US of A are all scheduled to happen this year. As well as a promised one in the UK, but I don't trust them to do fucking anything at this point. Voting is a very important decision that many choose not to do. Every election season, there's always a lot of discussion about whether or not voting actually works, and if there's any point in specifically you going to the polls. Everyone has a take based on their opinions and ideology, but this is a Mia Mulder channel, and here we do the boots on the ground research. So to find out if voting works, I ran for office. <laughs> and I won, kind of. We'll get into it soon enough, but if you're wondering why I haven't been able to make as many videos this last year, or why the ones that I've managed to do are riddled with editing mistakes, this is why. I suddenly have constituents to be responsible for, and a real office, and real political issues that I have to vote on every week that impact thousands of people's lives. And that gives me precious little time left to make YouTube videos, despite being promised before the election that this would not happen. I now have my current position thanks to voters making a democratic decision. And now I'm going to make their mistake your problem by rambling about it for God knows how long this video is going to be. And that makes me incredibly biased here. Because of course voting works, it gave me tax money. But I do also think it gives me the inside scoop about the impact of the votes that actually got me here in the first place. I want to start by saying, though, that the questions about voting, democracy, elections, what they are, and if they work or not, are perfectly valid questions to ask. And that I'm not going to encourage you to vote for any specific candidate in any specific election in this video. Except for maybe myself. Ladies and bees, they them and gentlemen, this is Democracy Manifest. Hi, welcome to my actual, actual office. I actually am an elected official. This is not a shitpost, and I am recording this from said office. I don't know how that was allowed. Also, to brag, isn't it wild how I've never failed any career goal I've set my eyes on? Modeling, done. Acting, did it. Becoming a YouTuber, crushed it. Become possibly the first trans woman ever elected as municipal councillor in Sweden? No problem. You think I'm arrogant? That's because I got good reason to be. You think I'm scared of you? I literally can not fail. I'm stronger. I'm smarter. I'm better. Can you tell the power is going to my head a little bit? I have mentioned an election 
and a party. But the vast majority of my audience is not from my country, Sweden, and especially not from the municipality in which I hold office. I have more followers on YouTube than there are people in the municipality. So I can't expect any of you to know either our electoral system or the political parties that participate in it, both of which are extremely relevant for this video at least the personal parts. But it is also a joke in Swedish political nerd circles that we are way more aware of American political systems than we are of our own, because you yanks are in the news all the goddamn time. So for everyone's benefit, let's go over some basic, both on the national level and here locally. Sweden is a constitutional monarchy. We have a king. Everyone loves him. He's goofy and he has no power. Compare this to the British king, which actually does have some power, but is forced to choose to not use them. But we Swedes don't trust the French. So we took all of the powers away. He's been in charge longer than any other Swedish monarch and is so popular that any mention of becoming a republic is basically heresy. The real power is in parliament called Riksdag who elect the government and prime minister. Parliament deals with national issues, but there are two lower levels of administration, much like a lot of countries have, regions and municipalities. Regions deal with semi-local issues that demand significant resources, such as healthcare, tourism, traffic, bus lines, and municipalities deal with local stuff and are sometimes the same as city governments. And they deal with schools, elder care, road maintenance, waste management, electrical services, social services, housing development, environmental management, parks, recreations. But here I come, the government, and I get to take 40% of your lunch. And all of that stuff, that's where I am, on the municipal level. I am not in parliament like some of you apparently believe. Yet. Never. Specifically, I am a representative in Sollentuna commune which is here on a map, which I can safely say because that information is public information. It would be weird if I couldn't tell anyone where I had been elected or who I was representing. Oh, oh, but before we go any further, I'm sorry, I realize I haven't told you about the parties within my own country yet. So let's do an overview of Swedish political parties so you know what I'm talking about. And in order of seats in parliament, those parties are Sweden's Social Democratic Workers' Party. Historically, pretty decent and explicitly socialist, and they were instrumental in building the workers' movement in Sweden. They have ruled Sweden with an iron fist for most of the 20th century, when they just kept racking up win after win after win, and they managed to make majority governments where they could do anything they wanted, from building the welfare state to implementing eugenics-based forced sterilization laws against minorities in 1934, which they abolished in 1976. <laughs> Except for trans people, where it was moved to another law which allowed us to change our gender and it was heralded as a progressive first in the world law uh, because it created a framework to change your legal gender for the first time. Which means it was adopted and mimicked by many countries all around the world and we didn't even get rid of that shit until 2013. Why you had to be sterile? Oh, it would make the paperwork too difficult. And the Social Democrats were in power both those times, and they still have not given a formal apology. Sweden Democrats. Okay, so these are the Nazi ones. There's more. No. Their members keep being outed as Nazis. Some of their leading politicians have said that Jewish and Sami people, an indigenous group here, can't be Swedish. They were the only party who straight up votes against <laughs> repealing the eugenics era forced sterilization laws against trans people. Are we the baddies? And who in 1993 showed up to a May Day demonstration armed with a fucking hand grenade and who currently wants to make teachers report undocumented students to the police and also deport the entire families of those convicted of crimes. Not family members who have also been convicted, all of your family members if only you are convicted. Or just like if you have bad vibes. Whatever the fuck that means. The Moderate Coalition Party, and this is the party of responsible economics and who are self-described as socially conservative but fiscally liberal. Okay, quick aside. So in America, liberal can often just mean someone on the left, but that's just because you only have the two options. Here, liberal means market liberal or classic liberal. And when someone says they're fiscally conservative in America, 
that just means that they're fiscally liberal everywhere else. They are the ruling party who managed to cobble together a coalition after the last election by selling their soul to Satan. And then we come to the left party, and that's the one that I'm a part of. It's not the smallest party, we have 24 seats, and we're not in charge yet and have never been in government, even if we have been a crucial support for social democratic governments at times. Because we're the fourth largest party, I mention us here, but we'll dig into us and our history more after I finish this list because I'm part of it and I have a lot more to say about it, okay? I'm not gonna gloss over my own party, I'm just saving it for a better time. We'll circle back to it in just a sec. Up next, we have the center party, and they're an interesting one. They have 24 seats. Typically, they're seen as a market liberal party that often but horns with other market liberal parties. And then we get to the Christian Democrats. They are the party of Jeebus cheese and Judeo-Christian values. European countries typically have Christian Democrats who are center-right, but who mostly focus on just being market liberals. Not ours, though. They're much more inspired by American right-wing evangelicals. They were founded because the government was gonna stop teaching kids to praise Jeebus, and they said, absolutely the fuck not you are. And they're not really representing the religious demographic in Sweden, guiding their principles in line with mainstream religious ideas, because, well, we don't have those. We're a very atheistic country. Instead, they find their base in independent cults. Oh, <coughs> sorry. Independent churches, like evangelicals. And then we get to the Green Party. They have 16 seats and they are the eco-warriors of Swedish politics. And they are kind of split between wanting to be a left-wing party with good environmental policy and being a environment policy at all cost party, which is good. Don't get me wrong, I like them a lot. But when it comes to questions about schools, or elder care, they aren't the ones I'm turning towards first. Solar panels though? You can't find anyone better. I uh, realize I forgot to summarize the Liberal Party, but that's okay, everyone forgets about them. And in my municipality, the ruling coalition is made up of moderates, liberals, Christian Democrats, and center partists, with the opposition being made up of the Social Democrats, the left party, the Greens as one united opposition, and the Swedish Democrats who can't sit with us. Now, you may think that because every other party that I've mentioned here has had a history segment that doesn't necessarily paint them in the best of light, I'm going to do the same with my own party. But you see, my party was actually formed as an offshoot of the Social Democrats, and as such, hasn't existed for as long as most other parties. So maybe that means we finally have a party without a dark and sordid history, Nope. In fact, it wouldn't be the worst argument to say that we have maybe one of the worst ones. Let's just say that the official party line is, let's not mention those parts when talking to the public. Which is making me very uncomfortable to sit here and talking about it as the representative to my audience. Unfortunately, this part is going to be a bit long because otherwise some of you are going to do your own research. You're not going to get the full picture and then you're going to accuse me of having some ideas that I don't have because it's YouTube, that's gonna happen anyway, but I'm going to impart context upon you, like it or not. So the left party was founded in May of 1917 due to a split in the Social Democratic Party because people couldn't agree on whether or not to support Baldy Bolshevik in Russia and whether or not the Social Democrats had had the right wing turn in recent years. This is often framed within Swedish discourse, even among many of my own party members, as cranky communists who weren't satisfied with the Social Democrats and left to follow in the steps of the Soviets. But this was in May, before John Lemon had his revolution. The Social Democratic Party at the time had a policy in place called the Resolution of Unity, which was a declaration of loyalty to the party line, which was to not be inspired by Lenin. In February of the same year, a little bit earlier, the head of the Social Democrats, Jalmar Branting, told the party conference that he was sick and tired of these goddamn leftists in his socialist movement and that the day of the conference would be a day of reckoning. Damn Scots! They ruined Scotland! You Scots sure are a contentious people. You just made an enemy for life! Expelling the entire left opposition and almost their entire youth wing. So these people said, fuck it, I'll make my own social democratic party with blackjack and hookers. And they did, and they called it the Swedish Social Democratic Left Party. They helped found the third international, better known as the Comintern, where they and all socialist parties present got the message that since now, 
there was a worker state. That worker state made the rules. Or else. The party eventually changed names to the Communist Party in 1921, split a billion times in the lead up to the Second World War, some clowns fell for the oldest trick in the book to join up with the Nazis for some reason, and a bunch of party members got stuck in Swedish internment camps because the Social Democrats here were scared of a left-wing revolution, which was a reasonable fear because there was street violence and terror attacks both from and directed towards leftists at the time. Let me tell you, it doesn't sound that good, does it? Is this a party I've decided to join? Anyway, after Stalin died, the party had to adjust and decided that maybe the Soviets weren't the shining light of communism after all. The party changed name again to Left Party Communists and became first among the European Communist parties to be in favor of achieving communism by embracing political democracy. Democracy is non-negotiable. Eventually, history happens and the Soviet Union falls apart. And in Europe, Communism becomes a hard sell. The party drops communism from both its name and the party platform and just becomes the left party with a focus on democratic socialism as its foundational ideology. You see now why I needed all of that context, right? Because I have not joined a communist party. But if you don't do your research, you might think we're Stalinists. Many in Sweden still do. And while I'll dive into this subject more a bit later, I want to specify that while I represent this party, I also disagree with many of its political positions, both historically and currently. But to be clear, I am not a member of the Communist Party, because our party is not communist. But let's hold off on any judgment, positive or negative, until you finish the video. First, we need to stick to the basics. Sweden is a representative democracy, and all of these levels have independent elections that just happen simultaneously, meaning that if a party has enough votes within the geographic area of governments, they will get a proportional representation in that government, even if they don't secure a majority in any specific voting district. If you get 4% of the national vote, congratulations! You're in parliament now, and you can collaborate or form coalitions with whoever you want, because your voice is represented, even if that voice is quite small. But this is a Swedish system, and most of my audience is American or British. And you use a different system called First Past the Post, which kind of is what it sounds like. You have the most votes, and you win. Seats in whatever government body are connected to party districts, and whoever gets the most votes in the district win the seat. Bim bam boom. This can tend though to lead to two party systems because you end up in situations where you don't want to support the candidate you really like because you don't want to split the vote and accidentally end up with the guy you like the least in charge. The classic dilemma that happens here is that you could end up in a situation where your political opponent is 100% Adolf Hitler. Bad candidate, we can't let him win. But your party has, in their infinite wisdom, chosen to nominate 75% Hitler. He's still mostly Hitler, but he's better than the alternative. And then election day comes around and you have the choice to vote for whoever you want. But since you know that these two options are the only ones with any real chance of winning, you'd waste your vote if you voted for 0% Hitler, making it all the more likely that 100% Hitler would win, which is the thing you don't want. So you end up having to vote for 75% Hitler. This is a bad system, except for the only benefit, which is that it's easy to understand. It's not complicated. You get more votes, you win. Easy peasy. But it's still a bad system, because you will have to justify why voting for 75% Hitler is bad. It should be obvious. He's 75% Hitler. Our system of proportional representation is much better. Here, we just end up with right-wingers ending up in coalition with 75% Hitler instead. But let's keep talking about some other voting system. Ranked choice voting operates by allowing you to rank the candidates you would like to vote for from most to least preferred. Candidates are then elected by needing to get at least 50% of the vote, but after each round of voting, if no one has over 50% of the vote, the ones with the least amount of votes will be eliminated and those who voted for them now have their second option counted instead, which then adds to the total vote tally of the other candidates. This continues 
until there is a winner. And this system is interesting because you get to keep the same basic system as first past the post. But the whole problem of splitting the vote goes away. You can still vote for whoever you want without having to worry about splitting anything because if they don't win, you get your second option or third. Let's also mention the single transferable vote. It works basically the same way, but instead of voting for one person, you're electing a group of people. And if one person has already been elected, the second option start counting for the second seats. You rank your choice of candidates, and if your number of one pick has already been elected, a proportional amount of the surplus votes are then transferred to the second option, as well as the candidates who did not get enough votes to get elected at all. All of these systems have their own benefits and drawbacks, and I personally think that proportional representation is the best among these at least, because it's relatively simple for everyone to understand, which is important in a democracy, while still being able to represent a diverse set of ideologies and viewpoints. And it's also how I got elected. <laughs> Suckers. So how the fuck did that happen? Hi. Over a bread tube of us. I stole this joke from uh, Harry. So, ah! Also, it's red. It's blue. God bless the US of A. <laughs> so. I got into politics when I moved to this municipality in 2021. The election was gonna happen in 2022 and I knew I wanted to help out my local party affiliate because I was settling down roots, planning to live here for a while and figured I should get involved in local issues. I also had and still have a bit of internal crisis going on. I've been asking myself, who am I? And why do I exist? And who made me? And what am I expected to do with my life? Well, one way to deal with a crisis like that is to ask yourself, what do you want to do with the world? What are your goals? And my goal has always been to make enough money to pay for rent and to make the world a better place. Beyond that, I'm pretty good when it comes to life goals. I am, however, incapable of actually holding down any real type of job or doing any type of like structured organizing that I think a lot of people expect like activists to do. So I, I can't do any of that stuff. It's part of the reason why I have this YouTube channel and why I talk about the things that I want to talk about. I could probably make a bit of a better career, I guess, if I decided to sell out significantly more, but I don't know, I guess I want to make content that helps people in some way. I feel like I haven't done that in a while. And for the longest time, I have had a little bit of a bias against the idea of content creation as a thing that you do to help people. I have gotten emails from a lot of people. I have had people reach out to me, letting me know that their videos have changed their lives for the better. And that's great. Legitimately, that is what I live for. It, means everything to me, but in my mind, I had always thought, well, I mean, it's not real politics, is it? Real change only happens by those who actually have the power to draft laws or make political choices about how things should be done. YouTubers don't really do that. So I figured, let's get involved. I know people have problems with elections and parliamentarism and the idea of becoming politicians, but I thought, why not use the system? Give democratic socialism the weapon of the enemy. Let us use it against them. You cannot wield it. None of us can. Now, before I dig too deep into like personal issues about me ending up in the position that I am, I also want to mention that I know I have a couple of party members who I know personally who watch my videos. So I'm not going to mention any names or drop too much gossip in this video. Let's start by saying that my party affiliate was amazing. It was headed by some of the most wonderful people in the world. And I have made friends for life in that group, but it is a small group. And at the time of the election, they needed all hands on deck. Solentuna is a small municipality overall but it's also a rich one, which means that it's maybe not the best recruiting ground for a formerly communist party. And so there was plenty for me to do from campaigning, hosting meetings, talking to the electorate. Cooking 
is art, and the shit I cook is the bomb, so don't be talented. And when the election itself came close, and the party came looking for candidates to potentially be their actual politicians, they asked me if I wanted to be one of them. Individual candidates here do technically matter, but because we're a proportional democracy, you don't really vote for individuals as much as you vote for a list of candidates prepared by the party. And depending on how many seats a party wins, that many people down the list are the people who will be elected. And the order of the list is set by the party. So if you want to be elected, you want to be at the top of the list. Now, I was new to the party. I knew I was not going to be at the top. I was not a high ranking member, but the election committee saw potential in me. And so they put me at slot number three. Our party was expected to at least keep our four seats in the council. So me becoming elected into the council was a reasonably safe bet. You can technically vote for individuals, and if they get a certain portion of the total vote, you can essentially skip the list, but that rarely happens. Being in council involves you going to a meeting once a month to vote on the big issues. It is the highest deciding body in municipal politics. Council kind of works as a local parliament, and you don't get paid a ton at all to do this alone. But I am not just in council. I am what's called group leader, which means that I am the person in charge of all of our elected officials in council. Micromanage. And our party also obtained a seat in the municipal board, which is one level higher than the council, as well as the executive committee of the board, which is yet another level above it. And that gives me the title of opposing councillor. There's a lot of titles and hierarchies in politics. And those titles do pay. Not a ton, though. I make way more money making YouTube videos than this extremely stressful stuff. Why am I doing this again? Why am I even here? But there are no elections for those spots. So how did I even get those positions? Well, remember how I ended up in position three. So the party at the time was small, but it was also having internal struggles because we're leftists, we love infighting, and two factions had essentially formed. One which was a bit more traditional and one which was a bit more progressive for the lack of a better term. Ideology did not really matter that much here. This was more of a personal issue. I'm not gonna go into too much detail. These people do watch my videos. But after the election, the party had to vote internally for who among the four should be group leader and who should be the board member. Those positions are paid, part-time positions. So it matters who sits there because that person is going to end up being the person who can spend time working for the party. They are essentially the local party representative. Now, number one and number two on the list were also members of the electoral committee. And that is the committee that is dedicated to finding candidates to fill positions. And they were also one of the factions in the party conflict. And they selected themselves for those paid positions. And this um, made sense in a way. They had experience, they were higher on the list, but they also made that list in the first place. And it's hard to get experience if new blood isn't elected ever. It's also bad form to pick yourself for the paying positions. You're not typically supposed to do that. It smells of corruption and favoritism in case you pick your friends. So you're not really supposed to do that. And so this enraged other members of the party, some of whom asked me during the meeting if they had even asked me if I was interested in those positions, which I could technically have considering I was one of the four elected members of the council. I hadn't, and I said so, leading to complete bedlam during this meeting because the whole point of the committee is to call around among all the eligible candidates and ask who would want to be interested and who would want to nominate themselves. And instead, they had just picked themselves. In the heat of the moment, this led to me being nominated and because I guess I didn't have beef with any faction, I managed to get more votes than the first nominees. I'm a unity candidate. 
Except, nah, because immediately after this, they both resigned from the party. Which is also, like, partially unfortunate, but also, like, I get it. But at the same time, it's like, suddenly I find myself in a leadership position, and half of our members of council had just left the party. And this was less than two months after the election itself. Here I am, having failed upward because they wanted to fill seats. <laughs> And because I was uncontroversial at the time. And now, here I am, burning out with fewer seats than would be available than if I hadn't joined in the first place. Feeling like if I don't do a good job, everything is going to crash and burn and it'll all be my fault. It's not a joke, really. Despite this position being technically a halftime position, I have never worked harder in my life. And balancing being an elected official with my YouTube channel is impossible to do. That's why videos have gotten further and further apart, and why my last video, which I was kind of proud of, ended up being absolutely filled with editing mistakes and being quite rushed. Because while editing, which is a time-consuming process, I also had to make a 50-page municipal budget, perfectly balanced, covering all the political positions and being budgeted and funded and motivated for in terms of taxes and like... There simply isn't enough hours in the day. But this maybe begs the question of what do I do all day? Well, looking from the outside in, it doesn't seem like you do quite a lot. You go to three meetings a month. But there are also internal party meetings to go to because, well, the politicians there need to be organized. They need information and we need to coordinate. So that's an additional couple of meetings. There is also staff working with me and they also need to be coordinated and I need things to do for them. And every meeting has to be prepared for and every meeting is at least a couple of hours long and has dozens of individual points on the calendar and every meeting has to be prepared for and every meeting has at least dozens of points that you need to go through and each point usually has the equivalent paperwork of at least two dozen pages sometimes several hundred and you have a choice then you can either be very well prepared or you can just say fuck it and i have a sense of responsibility here because my election to this position led to an internal party crisis. That probably would have happened anyway, but it is still directly my fault in this case. And, well, I care about politics. And I care about making the world a better place. So I want to be prepared. So I read that paperwork and I prepare answers to it. And I prepare my own dozens of pages of paperwork for each political propositions that I do. And you end up in a position where you just write continuously about politics and that's fine and good right but i've been doing this for over a year now and um none of my proposals have been passed get rejected swallow sadness so my job now is less actually doing proposals but more like making a sound argument and showing the electorate what you could have had if you had voted more for me and that's fine that's what you're supposed to do, I guess. But it is also exhausting and demoralizing. And it's not what I want to do. I spend my days contacting media outlets so that they will report on the proposals that I have to promote the party, to stand by the party. And there just isn't enough hours in the day to do all of that while still having a healthy social life, a healthy personal life, and being able to have a YouTube channel. So this might lead you asking, why haven't I taken a break from YouTube? Why haven't I just put my channel on hold while doing politics work? Why haven't I quit? Well, elections are a messy business, and after the election, the results were what they were, and we did not have enough seats to negotiate ourselves as maybe we could have or would have wanted to do. And while I do have a responsibility, I also have a temporary position. Partially because there will be another election in about two and a half years, but my position will actually go to someone else within a year. Because as part of coalition building, 
and as part of negotiating with other opposition parties, my seat that's paid, the one that actually pays my rent, is actually going to go to the Green Party. The entire opposition managed to get three seats on the municipal board, but the Social Democrats wanted two of them, and we are three opposition parties. The Social Democrats are significantly larger than we are, so my party and the Greens will share that spot. And after that time, there would be no politics money coming into my bank account, which means I need to keep this channel going. I need to have some out after I finish politics, which I will have to do soon anyway. Now, splitting that seat might not sound like a win. It was actually a significant win for the party. We have not had a position like this locally in years, so that's good. <laughs> but despite this and all of the stress, there are a few things I love in this role. I get to have a first-person insight into the workings of our democratic system and an opportunity to change it from the inside. And I love having this unique experience. I love the power, <laughs> the little I have. I love meeting people. I love it all. I do, however, miss feeling happy. So what have I learned? But okay, we've already strayed significantly from the topic at hand. We were talking about whether or not voting works, not how it works. So let's go back to that a bit more. But the problem is, when we think and how we think about democracy and voting, that heavily depends on the voting system and also the attitudes you have regarding voting in any specific electorate. I think, for example, that democracy kind of works a little bit here at least in Sweden in a proportional representational democracy but maybe I would have a different answer if I lived in a system with a different electoral system. So here comes the problem then. What does it mean to live in a democracy? The idea behind democracy is quite easy. The people should decide. But obviously, because there are many different voting ways and electoral systems and things like this, we have various ways of how to do that. And so to really discuss this properly, we need to define what democracy is. Democracy comes from the Greek demos, meaning people, and kratia, which stands for power. But who are the people? And what is power? Let's talk about people first. Generally, in Western modern democracies, we discuss two classes of people. Not those two. We talk about the electorate and the elected, sometimes referred to as the political class. I am part of the political class by virtue of being a politician, and you are most likely part of the electorate, although also most likely not part of my electorate, because my videos are in English and my municipality is very small. The issue of almost every single type of democracy around the world is that you can't vote on every single issue that exists, that happens, because that would take a lot of work and it would be impossible to organize and to do fairly. And so we outsource democracy to someone else, the politicians. And a significant part of problems within democracy kind of boil down to how much power we want to outsource. Living in a representational democracy, or the argument that a lot of Americans will use, living in a republic, not a democracy, means that you won't have a voice on every single issue that happens in society, because that's not your job. It's better to have someone who is specialized in the task of having opinions which is kind of like being a YouTuber, honestly. And for the longest time, I had an idea of politicians because of this specialization being exceptionally or especially smart or savvy people when it comes to political theory or ideology or society management. They would have to be, right? Especially since the decisions that they do affect thousands of people. You would be forced into being a reasonably smart person because if you fuck up your choices, you can ruin people's lives. If I fuck up a cup of coffee as a barista, I have a negative impact on one person. If I fuck up the schools, well... And surely, people wouldn't vote people in if they weren't a special type of person at least savvy enough to do the things that they want to do. 
And now that I've been in politics for almost two years and met a significant amount of politicians on a national and occasionally international level, I can confidently say that that is bullshit. <laughs> politicians are, and I mean this in every sense of the word, just as capable and smart and stupid as any normal person. Well, duh. But what about power then? What kind of power are we talking about? Well, we in the West have already made an arbitrary decision to decide what is politics and what is not. In my last video, I talked a little bit about the economy in general, but that's something that a lot of capitalist nations have chosen to not manage as much as you could have, because that's not politics, that's just the market. So you don't change that, no power over that. How about you working? you being a person working under a boss, you're still a citizen. Well, also there we have made a decision. You do not have power over your workplace, so no democracy there either. That's also not politics. The power to change society? Well, if you work at a big company, your boss probably has more power to change society than I do. So we don't live in a democracy all the time. Political power then is an arbitrary delineation of where we want everyone to have some input, but not total input, which in the end is actually quite limited. For example, unless you live in a few specific areas, you don't actually have the power to change anything beyond picking who you want to have the actual power, your representative. The voters of Solentuna municipality didn't vote on their school budgets, they voted for me and a bunch of other people to have that power on their behalf. Which is a practical matter, not everyone can have their voice heard, we would get nothing done. But what power do we as politicians have? Initially, that question might seem stupid. I have one vote in whatever chamber I belong to, and that is the power I hold. But that's not fully true, because it's not the only power I hold. I also have a YouTube channel with more subscribers and influence than I would ever have even if I manage to speak directly into the heads of every single person living in the municipality. The things I say here also have an impact on your lives. Media reach is also a form of power, as is charisma. Or as I say people on TikTok call it, riz. In council, every vote does matter, but I have seen far more voters be changed and policy be enacted by one politician being charming and convincing to another. Even such things as basic as personal energy is also a form of power. If I'm sick away from work for a few weeks because I have depression and the mind orbs kick in and I can't do anything, including make videos, yeah, then the amount of political propositions that I have goes down. Debates happen less. The amount of answers that the people in charge have to answer to are reduced. So even a healthy immune system is a type of political power. Or if I just stopped caring, I could just show up to my meetings and do my obligatory voting and I would be paid the same. But a lot of people would say that I'm not living up to the spirit of my job if that's what I ended up doing. But let's say that I'm a lousy politician in the sense that I produce very little actual paperwork and come up with few solutions to problems, but I am very charming and funny. People might vote for me then anyway, and I could stay in power. Or let's say that I'm very good at looking like I produce good work, but in reality, I'm just good at curating my own image. All of those forms of power you're also more likely to have if you're wealthy, young, white, etc. I have a YouTube channel and many other politicians are also business owners or highly educated, which does not reflect the actual reality of most working people even in parties this far to the left. So power in a democracy isn't just a mechanical lever that puts more weight on either side, it's a complex series of influences and viewpoints. But those aspects, voters have extremely little influence over. And then we come back to the question of people. Who is it that gets to vote? Citizens, first off, if you're an illegal immigrant, you can't vote. And, at least in Sweden, if you're a legal immigrant but not a citizen, you can vote, but not in every election. This is still, by most people, considered somewhat fair and reasonable. 
But why though? Well, because only people who have a vested interest in the outcome are the ones who should have a say in that outcome. You, why are only citizens allowed to vote? It's a reward. What the Federation gives you for doing federal service. No. Let's go back to ancient Greece, often seen as the birthplace of democracy and whose modern equivalent has my undying loyalty until the day I die. Evicrastio dias de hormones turcoristo. I would like to formally apologize to the nation of Greece. In ancient Greece, or Athens specifically, calm down Spartan fanboys, the vast majority of people did not have the right to vote in the goings-on of the Athenian state. Unless you were a citizen and a man and had completed military training. Service guarantees citizenship. And that makes sense on some level, even if it is unfair and wouldn't be seen as fair today. But even many modern democracies still make this arbitrary distinction of who has a vested interest when deciding who gets to have a vote. For example, non-citizens typically don't get a vote, despite living in a country having an election. Felons in some countries also don't get to vote with the argument that they have forfeited their stake. Children also don't get to vote, arguing that they're not mature enough to have a say, despite them definitely having a vested interest in their future. But those lines are all arbitrary because we have decided who has the right here. So far, this still makes sense, even if it does dilute the idea of democracy a little bit. If democracy is the people, we're already making distinctions of which people. If we want proper democracy, we should be critical to some of those arbitrary distinctions. And many people are. But let's take this a few steps further than other people do, just as a fun thought experiment. Take, for example, the idea that voting is typically restricted to members within a nation. Well, this is, of course, seen as a norm, and I'm not arguing against it necessarily. I don't think it should be any other way. But I, as a European and a Swede whose country has left neutrality behind, will have my life affected by the next American presidential election. They asked me that question. One of the presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay? You're delinquent? He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. I wouldn't be affected as much as an American citizen would be. But nonetheless, I do have skin in the game. Of course, my input shouldn't matter. After all, I am not American. So why should my voice matter? But remember, the line most people draw is of who is affected. Democracy, then, even in its best of circumstances, is not really a choice between those who are affected by a decision making the decision together. It's instead a self-inclusive group using the authority they have previously given themselves to exercise that authority using force. And using force is violence, the supreme authority of which all other authority is derived. Well, okay, maybe not, but let's examine democracy from the other direction by looking at the problems that arise when it doesn't work and why. This is a lot of philosophical mumbo jumbo. Surely they have done studies on this stuff, right? Does voting work, yes or no? Well, it, it really depends on how you define work and how you define voting and the impact of voting. Th studying this stuff is quite difficult, but let's assume that it didn't. If voting did not work and does nothing to change the material conditions of the voting populace, then why do so many people who already have a lot of power want to take voting away from you? Authoritarians around the world want to control the way you vote and preferably would prefer if you don't vote at all. If voting didn't work, why would they want to do that? But this is not the full range of the argument. A lot of people will argue that they want to take away your right to vote but that voting still doesn't work. The reason for this is because of the distinction between the idea of the state and the government. They are not the same thing. The state is who you are electing people into. The government are the people themselves. Sweden can have a completely new government, but the state of Sweden would be generally unaffected. The argument then goes that authoritarians, who are, I assume, selfish people want to take away your right to vote 
because they, as individuals, want to remain in charge of the state. But those who criticize voting as being ineffective are not just criticizing the people being authoritarian, they're criticizing the mechanisms of the state. And changing the mechanisms of the state is not something that you vote over. You're simply voting on who gets to be in charge of it. There's the famous saying from the French king Louis XIV, I am the state. But he never said that. In fact, what he did say, which I think is a lot more insightful, is I die, but the state will always remain. And then there's also the question of what we can do and what we actually do. Let's say that the system we have is perfect and everyone has the right and opportunity to go and vote. There will still be many people who don't, for whatever reason. And for everyone that doesn't, that increases the voting powers of those who do. This is an important thing to remember when considering the fact that the demographic that is least likely to vote is the one with the lowest income and lowest standard of living. Surely they would have the highest vested interest in the outcome. And this is a huge factor as to why it can often seem like democracy preserves the status quo or benefits the rich. Well, it's because the electorate, or the voting electorate rather, is shifted towards them and their interests. And then you can end up in a situation where the people who don't vote don't have their voices heard. But that's pretty expected, wouldn't you think? And this is where voter suppression comes back. Because, well, which group is it that has the least incentive to vote? Or rather, has the most obstacle in their way to go and vote? If you're rich, and you have a lot of free time, you can immerse yourself in politics and ideology and esoteric theory. Daddy, give me more money. You can only really do this if you have the money to support yourself. Which is why I, much like my buddy here, keeps begging other people for their money. I don't want to work for a living. I want to theorize. <laughs> and this impact matters. My party is strongest in areas where poverty is high and among those who suffer the greatest under capitalism and the market. They are the ones who share our ideology that those are the causes for bad living conditions, but they are also the districts with the lowest turnout. Had those districts matched other areas of the municipality, we would probably have at least one more seat in council, which would have been enough to potentially unseat the current majority here. One seat. So, at this stage, of course, voting matters. Because in my case, it could have made the difference between making me opposition council to making me possibly the vice mayor. Assuming, of course, that I could bully the social democrats into letting me be vice mayor, which is not necessarily a sure thing. Since our parties broke up, we um, are hesitant to cooperate a lot, but that is not the full story. So let's talk about violence. Is violence the supreme authority from which all other authority is derived? It sounds like a joke or a maxim uttered by an authoritarian teacher trying to get you to join the military in a sci-fi movie. But what if there is something to that? Throughout most of human history, people haven't lived in states. We have lived in small villages or in feudal societies. Sure, you could, previously in European history, rule your country by going on your horse with your buddies and going to places and telling people what you wanted them to do. That's fair and valid. <laughs> Maybe you need to outsource some of that work to some of your buddies, and that's how you get feudalism. But what if society becomes so complex or large or complicated or just advanced that you can't do that and neither can all of your buddies even if you decided to work together. You need to hire people to do that work for you. You need bureaucrats. The idea of there being a state is quite different than there being nationalities or a people. But a state can only work by telling you what to do by limiting your natural born freedoms in exchange for something. And in connection to that, philosophers started thinking, well, what's the best way to do that? And also, how are we doing it right now? What does it mean to be part of a democracy? Democracy is simply a way to structure a society 
So what does it mean to be in a society? To talk about this, let's mention social contract theory. At its core, the theory suggests that people live together in society in accordance with an agreement that establishes moral and political rules of behavior. Think of it as we're all just agreeing to live in a society. Excuse me, I, I was waiting for you. Where? I didn't see you. I've been standing here for the last 10 minutes. I won't be long. Um, that's not the point. The point is, I was here first. Well, if you were here first, you'd be holding the phone. You know, we're living in a society. We're supposed to act in a civilized way. Does she care? No. Does anyone ever display the slightest sensitivity over the problems of a fellow individual? No. No. A resounding no. This has been a hotly debated idea within political philosophy. Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, John Wreck Rousseau, and Proud Hahn themselves have debated this a lot. Hobbes thought that without a social contract, humans would just live in brutal conflict with each other. He described a life without a social contract as nasty, brutish, and short. Describing, of course, my ex-girlfriend. He argued, overly simplified, that society would crumble unless we have an agreement with a higher authority to keep us in line. John Locke, on the other hand, had a different perspective on the whole issue. He argued that the social contract does not exist between individuals and the authority, like a monarch, but between individuals because we know what happens if we don't have one. And today, social contract theory is Controversial, still today, but it is still around in our common understanding about politics in general. It is the reason that a lot of people pay taxes without fighting about it first. Very few people have to be forced into paying taxes. A lot of people just do it because it's what you're supposed to do. And that is essentially the modern equivalent of the social contract. We follow laws, we participate in the democratic process, we go vote. No one's forcing us to do it, but we do it because it's what we're supposed to do. Some thinkers, when it comes to the social contract, argue that the idea of the social contract only exists as a valid form of government, the consent of the governed, for example, if there is no viable rebellion against it. But in theory, you could fight it, and let's say, that you don't want to live in the society that we have right now, you think that society should be different. You don't want to follow the social contract that aligns you into obeying it. What happens then? What happens when the contract is perceived as being unfair or broken? Democracy, then, comes into play here as another layer in this political soup, letting you have a structured, reasonable way to disagree with the already existing status quo and the social contract as it exists right now, in a way that doesn't cause violence. You don't have to have a peasant's rebellion against the emperor, you just have to Pokemon go to the polls. Ich weiß nicht, wer den Protestantismus geschaffen hat, aber ich habe versucht herauszufinden, wie wir protestantisch zur Wahl gehen können. And in theory, those two systems working together, operating as they should, leads to a really fine society. Society is nice and peaceful, and if it isn't, you can change it in a way that is also nice and peaceful. But what if that doesn't work? What if democracy doesn't offer you the solutions to the problems that you have? Let's say you don't want to pay taxes. Let's say you don't want to follow some law. Based, first of all, can I say that? <laughs> Hold on, I'm, I, every video I have one of those like, should I say this? There's a lot of things I'm not supposed to say, but no one stopped me yet. And here's where we go into violence. Obviously we as a civilized society would never 
stoop to using violence to follow our political goals, that is, of course, the methods of terrorists and authoritarians. But if you don't follow the law, a cop is going to come and arrest you. If you don't pay taxes, someone is going to come and try to take the taxes. The government. And if you fight them and resist in any way, the police will fight you. And that is also violence. Let's say, also, hypothetically, that there's an election, 98% of the vote goes to one candidate, has massive electoral support, and he passes popular laws. But you don't like it. Democracy has instituted the law, and reasonably, it has almost unilateral support, but not quite. You personally don't like the law. It's about, God, I don't know, mandatory fursuits Thursday. And you don't like that, for God knows what reason, you're wrong. Uh, and if the social contract and democracy and our wholesome liberal values or whatever the fuck you want to call it, are all followed, you should, in theory, be able to motion against the law. But you can't fight against it. Because it's mandatory. Put on the fursuit. 20th century German sociologist Max Weber talks about violence as being a definitional part of what a state is. Maxi Boy argues that the state has a monopoly on legitimate violence. And what he means by that is to say that the state is the sole entity which can determine which violence is legitimate. The police can come, they can arrest you, do basically whatever they want with you. But if you fight back, you can get into even more trouble. The state can, at any point, say that the actions of the police are legitimate and the actions of you are not. The legitimacy of the violence becomes the legitimacy of the state. This forces us to ask some kind of dark questions about the nature of even having a state at all. The idea that there should be a force that can monopolize violence against anyone for any reason it's not one that I'm super comfortable with. But it is what it is, and today we do have states. It is what it is. It's that monopoly that distinguishes the modern state from feudalism. In feudalism, you have your local lord, the church, the supreme monarch, tons of different authorities, all of which have the power to exert force on you. In the modern day, it's just the state. This did not happen out of a normal, natural progression into modern society. The inevitable evolution of history, because if you've watched any of my previous videos, you know that that doesn't exist. But rather, from two different viewpoints, either from the expansion of the authoritarian state, where the monarch needs to have more effective rule and basically kicks off any competitors. Or from people deposing the other authorities, like the monarch, in revolutions. When you depose the church and the king, well, you don't want them to come back, do you? So they're not allowed to do anything anymore. Only you are. Violence then becomes the supreme authority if we insist on having a state. And imagining a world where we don't is difficult to imagine, primarily because that's what we have in the modern day. And despite all of the problems, I do prefer modern society over feudalism or what came before. I like having medicine. That's not to say you need a state to have those things, it just means it's difficult to imagine because that's all that I have experience with. And in the West, we tend to not think about these things too much. But in scenarios and cases where states have been destroyed, suddenly these questions do become exceedingly relevant. Take a country where the state was all just destroyed entirely by an outside force like Iraq. If people in general don't see police violence as legitimate, the state loses its own authority. 
because it can no longer enforce the things that it wants to enforce. People will rebel against violence, which is a normal and natural thing to do. And when a government which has had legitimacy falls apart, a new government might not have that and might not be able to make a state. After the Iraq war and a new government was put in place and the state building project begun, that became difficult. In the eyes of a lot of people, that new Iraqi government had no legitimacy. And the violence that they did in order to exert their authority was not valid and therefore could easily be resisted. You don't have to follow the social contract because the contract isn't valid. You didn't sign it with those people. This is what opens up for other authorities to exert violence instead. Because if there's no monopoly, well, anyone can do it. If you can't be punished for it, you can become the state. And this is exactly what happened in the case of the Iraq war. A significant amount of the people who made up the initial founding members of ISIS did not see the governments and states of Iraq and Syria as legitimate. But this forces us to ask some quite uncomfortable questions because does that mean in order to have a stable and secure society, we need to do legitimate violence? You can be frustrated with democracy because it has just enough limits to not let you do what you want to do, but if you have a secret police force that monitors every single person's move and has total control over your life, well, do you even need democracy at that point? And this means that a significant amount of the work that you can do within the electoral political system is going to be underpinned by the threat of violence. It is quite reasonable to think that maybe you don't want to be part of that. You could, for example, argue for a society without a state, but where the individuals police each other. Not a monopoly on violence, but communal decision about legitimate violence instead of the state having that power. The state would therefore not exist, ipso ergo, stateless society. Because again, remember, government is not the same thing as state. But let's circle back a little bit to the thing that I actually do. I am not a supreme monarch yet, and I am not the state entirely yet, but I am a local politician, so let's focus on that. I am in opposition. I'm not actually in power, so the things that I do actually don't have any threat of violence against anyone. That's not my job, essentially. My job in opposition is to criticize the ones who are in power, showing the electorate an alternative while keeping the majority on their toes. But you don't need to be a politician in order to do those things. And it's not always the best way to affect social change. In 2016, long before I decided to get into politics and long before I made this YouTube channel, I was doing trans activism in a fun way. Me and a bunch of my friends started an organization that we called the Trans Defense because we were big nerds. We had a big shield as a logo and the idea was that like, we are protecting trans people. It was very fun. And in 2016, we decided to take over the Swedish Ministry of like Healthcare Management called Socialstyrelsen, but I don't exactly know how to translate that in the best way. Government office, essentially. And we had some demands. Stop deporting people, for example. Make it easier to get trans healthcare. Stop restricting estrogen as much as you're doing, which you're weirdly doing a lot for some reason here. It was fun. It was a great time. It was a great night, actually, because we stayed in there, you know, after we weren't allowed to leave. And eventually the police did come and kick us out. State monopoly of violence in action. And we had to leave and we didn't accomplish basically anything of our goals. But we accomplished something else. Dozens of trans people, mostly young and pre-transition trans people, reached out to us after that event to tell us that for the first time ever, they didn't feel alone. A lot of people, especially from rural Sweden, felt like someone were fighting for them, making their voices 
feel heard. Two people even credited us with helping having saved their lives because they felt that they had no one. But now at least someone was taking the fight. In my current role, that doesn't happen. But it does here on YouTube. Since starting my channel, I've had dozens, maybe hundreds at this point, of trans people reach out to me to tell me that my shittily edited videos shot in my bedroom has helped them during a dark time of their life, or helped them think about their gender, or helped them realize that they needed to transition. That is something that I truly value and I cherish. And that's just my experience here on YouTube. But the same thing could be said for all sorts of people who do political content, but aren't politicians. Journalists, scientists, comedians, all of them do good work that people like and learn from and grow from as individuals. And that is also significantly important political work. People conflate the good that those people do with the idea that they should be in politics. And I get it, Jon Stewart is a fine comedian, but he doesn't want to run for president. And I think he has realized what I am only starting to realize, that he feels that he can do more good for the world by doing the work he's doing right now. If I were to measure the amount of impact that I have on the world in a positive way, judging from my inbox, which is the only way that I have to measure that, I feel like I could be doing better and have been doing better before I went into politics. The idea that politics is where the real social change happens was something that I believed for a long time, especially before, right before I went into politics. I liked doing political commentary as one likes to do, but real change happens in the seat of power. I'm not sure I believe that anymore. That's not to say that content creation is more impactful than politicians. That's just objectively not true. But I think in my case, regarding the impact that I have very limitedly in politics, it might be true in my case, and it could be true in many cases. If you are a person who values the truth, who values curiosity, who values making the world a better place, well, maybe politics is not the best and only way for you to change the world. And isn't that just frustrating? I think there is something to say about the idea that the state has tricked us into thinking that it has a monopoly on everything. That we conflate the ideas around politics and government and state so much that we have forgotten that while the state might have a monopoly on violence, that does not mean it should or has a monopoly on democracy and change. If we think that the only way to change the world is in the seats of power, in the hallways of elections, the world is never going to change. A lot of people who have changed the world significantly have not held political office at all. Hell, I have a picture of Karl Marx in my office and his impact on the world has been enormous, gigantic, and he has also never been in politics. Valuing knowledge and trying to make the world a better place by thinking how you can do that, which ideas you should and maybe have to question, that is how you change the world. But that is not to say that voting and democracy doesn't work. And I want to make it clear here that I am, in a very un-American meaning, a Democrat, in the sense that I think democracy is good and that we should do it and participate in it, and that it is nice that we don't have authoritarian leaders that rule over us. But we have to be careful to not let that power that we give to someone else become that new authority. It's a nefarious trick that the state has played on all of us that in order to change the world, we have to do it on the state's terms. I think that the values of democracy 
and individual liberty and working for the collective good are good values that we should work towards. But that requires we do that all the time in our lives and not just once every four years outsourced to someone else. Because what good is the concept of democracy really when the reality of democracy is limited? Okay, so let's talk about ideology a little bit. As a political YouTuber, I've managed to avoid using ideological labels to describe what I believe. Previously, I have preferred to sort of let my opinions speak for themselves. If you have an opinion that you disagree with, that's fine. But if I have a label that you see before my opinion, people tend to judge me on those instead. So I don't want to do that typically. But now I'm a politician and that means by default that I represent the ideology of the party. And that is the ideology of a democratic socialism and of feminism and criticism of the market economic system that the world has right now. I believe in high taxes. In fact, I proposed a massive tax increase in municipal council budget debates that, of course, were rejected. And I believe in using those high taxes to fund a large public sector that works for the benefit of everyone, especially those who are poorest amongst us. But remember, this is the most left wing you can get in established Swedish politics. There are more left wing parties but they're very uninfluential. And at a certain point, you do actually want to do something with your ideology. But what is my ideology, personally? Well, let's say this. The party I represent does not want to even discuss the idea of legalizing or decriminalizing cannabis or any other narcotic. They don't want to expand nuclear power, and they think that the Swedish model of sex work is fine, and dandy. The last of which is a topic I'm saving for a future video, so I'm gonna not talk about that one too much. But let's talk about the first. I love drinks. I have to call them drinks, otherwise YouTube hates me. But listen, I like them. Hypothetically, if the police or my party leader is watching this, I have never done any drinks, and the cocaine in the left party offices definitely wasn't me. In case someone's confused, it wasn't. I'm not in parliament, remember? But on a philosophical level, I don't think, for example, that the government should have any right to punish you for what you choose to put into your own body. Or, frankly, to do whatever you want with your own body as long as you don't harm anyone else. What's next? Requiring a license to make toast in your own damn toaster? I would like to see my country decriminalize cannabis, for example, but also to loosen restrictions on medical psychedelic research and similar topics. I think that that would be a good thing to do, considering Swedish mental services are in the bits and we have one of the highest drug lethality levels in the world. And I also know from personal experience that medically assisted psychedelic therapy can do wonders for victims of PTSD. And I think it would be good for society at large to not stigmatize even basic research into those methods. And if the government got in the business of selling, instead of gangs, organized crime would see one of their largest sources of revenue be taken from them. But the party says no. And as a representative, I sometimes find myself in situations where proposals come across my desk in municipal councils regarding possession. I'm not in power, and therefore I can get away with not saying much of anything. But I wish that I could be a larger voice on this issue. But I can't, really. And even if I wanted to be and go rogue, I don't feel like I should. I have been elected as a representative of the party, so it would be unfair to the voters to start going rogue. And if I did go rogue, I could risk being shut out from the party. Maybe not officially, but I know of multiple party members who say that they have found themselves socially excluded out in the cold, not nominated for future positions and not included in future debates. And that's fine. That's still democracy. But that is another major limit to democracy that is almost impossible to avoid. But it is still a limitation, nonetheless. Parties. Political parties are a staple of democracies basically everywhere. And in the example that I just told you, parties can serve 
as a way to conform opinion. In Sweden, people do generally vote for parties rather than individuals. So in order to affect change, you have to represent your party as best as possible. But then individual opinion now has to go through this whole new system before it's allowed to have an opinion publicly within the party. But every party works differently and they manage themselves with very little oversight, which is a good thing. But then you end up with a situation where you have multiple different systems of democracy having to work together within one democracy already. Some parties may have a very easy time hearing the individual variety of opinions among their politicians, and some parties might be strict conformists. This problem is less severe in representational democracies, where you can easily form your own party or faction without worrying of splitting votes too much. But if you want to make a difference in a two-party system, it becomes extremely difficult to have any diversity of opinion, because you need to fit into the already two existing options. Well, I believe I'll vote for a third party candidate. Go ahead. Throw your vote away! <laughs> <laughs> Making issues around party loyalty more pressing than maybe we would expect from a democratic system. At least in my representational system, we have eight options and more locally, which isn't like an infinite amount, but it's at least more than most people maybe need, and most people can find something that's close enough to want to support, like me with the left party. Another major danger is risking power, becoming entrenched into the parties themselves, and they can often choose to act in ways that benefit the party over democratic principles. Why would you want to change anything if the goal of the party is simply to be in power? I guess I could also just replace the painting with whoever I wanted. It doesn't need to be Karl Marx. Sometimes. Despite all of the needs and reasonable issues and how democracy is supposed to work, I sometimes feel like I have lost hope for it. Not because of anything that doesn't work, but because of the fact that a lot of the time, most people don't seem to value it as important anymore. For the majority of my life, I had no idea who represented me in the municipal council. Most people don't, despite being fully aware about the electoral makeup of multiple American government uh, bodies, for a lot of people, politics is entertainment and a show rather than what it actually is, which is you taking your own vested interest in the goings on of your society, which is not something you can do if you don't take that active interest. That's not to say that you can just look up whoever is in charge and call it a day, but you need to actively think about your own thoughts and ideology and the changes that you would like to see in the world. What kind of society would you like to have? And what steps do you think should be actively taken right now in order to build it. A lot of people who are very politically aware online will have the end goal in mind. We want to have communism, but how do we get there? There is a gap, but that gap is politics. If you don't do that part, you don't care about politics. You daydream, and that is difficult. It takes work. Again, you can only really do that if you have the resources and time and dedication to do it. But maybe you think, I don't have to care that much because there's not that many important issues that happen. And when they do, then I go vote. But do you? And do you care enough at those specific issues? Two years ago, in February of 2022, the Russian Federation invaded Ukraine in a war of territorial aggression, leading to mass panic in Europe now that a war between two sovereign nations was once again raging in Europe. As a politician, I have met multiple Ukrainian refugees whose towns and villages no longer exist due to this war. I have personally always believed that war must be avoided whenever possible, and when it happens anyway, it is the responsibility of those who can help to do so, and to make sure that the aggressor is not rewarded in any way for the aggression. As a result of this invasion and the now warmongering nation right on my country's doorstep, our government applied to join the military alliance NATO, a decision I do not think will lead to better security for our country. 
which I live in. Already, leading politicians have bowed their heads to authoritarian leaders, harassed personal friends of mine because of their opposition to said leaders. They have downplayed the human rights violations of said authoritarians and all to secure the unilateral support of NATO. I am against that and I am against the prospect of American military bases on Swedish soil, of nuclear weapons on Swedish bases, and of sending people to die in wars in the interest of international shipping. This might have been a reasonable move. I don't personally believe it, but my voice didn't matter in this issue, because during the election prior of 2018, a majority of parliament parties were against Sweden joining NATO, including the Social Democrats. The Social Democrats formed a government after that election, and in May of 2022, four months before the next election, and as a direct response to Russian aggression, the Social Democrats changed their view and the government applied to join the military alliance. Voters did not have a chance to have any input on this issue. There was no referendum, and frankly, very little public debate about it. In the chaos of those early months of the war, the consensus was that democracy doesn't matter. Now, we are on the verge of joining, and might even have joined by the time this video comes up, due to the application of a government which promised that they wouldn't. Swedish neutrality is dead. And in order to protect our apparent values of cherishing human rights and democratic values, we have now sold weapons of death to politicians previously described as authoritarians. Democracy and human rights and values are all important. But protecting those demands the price of freedom. Protecting yourself against authoritarians who don't value those values by selling out those values to other authoritarians is, in my mind, nonsense. And the fact that we had never even had a vote or a voice on this question, that bothers me a lot. So, does democracy work? Sure until the people in charge decide it shouldn't. Ha, huh. so here we are. What do I have to say about voting then? At the end of all of this, well, I think the voting is flawed. It is not going to produce the results you might want either in the long term or in the short term. But that doesn't take away from the fact that it's effective if you want it to be. I personally think that you should vote, and I think that you are leaving power on the table if you don't. It doesn't take a lot of effort to go and vote, but I also think that you shouldn't be reliant on voting to solve the problems that are facing our society. There are other ways to fix things, and you should do those also. Your vote does matter, weirdly enough. But I say this within my own voting system. Because my opinion here could be radically different if I lived in a place with a first-past-the-post voting system. And when splitting the vote could end up with a bad person in power. The real problem with a first-past-the-vote system is that voting at all risks legitimizing a truly bad candidate simply because the other candidate is even worse. I don't think that democracy works well when you have to enthusiastically vote for bad candidates. But that is the situation that a lot of people are facing right now. Take for example the idea of voting between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. We have two ancient old men with pretty bad politics, but one of which has worse politics. So I guess you have to vote for the one with just bad politics. That's not really democracy, is it? That's basically as close to authoritarianism as you can get. It's authoritarianism with a choice. Had the election turned out slightly different here in my municipality, I could have ended up in a position of power. And the choices and votes that I do would have a more material impact on people's lives. But at the same time, my personal goal has never been to refine policy about parking or roundabouts or even pretty important issues like school lunches. They are important and someone needs to do them, but that was never my goal. My goal was always to maximize the amount of good that I can do in the world. 
and I'm not sure I have been doing that. Here, in the end, I think I can accomplish more significant impact here on YouTube than I could anywhere else. If I ended up in the Riksdag or in the European Parliament, maybe I would have a different opinion, but I am unlikely to end up in any of those positions and I cannot rely on that as a sure thing. Meanwhile, not to brag, but my channel is growing and I have a pretty sizable audience and the impact I have here is more noticeable to me. And unless YouTube decides to fuck me over, my channel is not going to go away at the end of a four year term. For my own personal goals of maximizing good in the world while also keeping my own sanity in check, I think this is where I belong. I miss making YouTube videos as my thing, and now that I am medicated for the ADHD I apparently have, which I did not know at the time of the election, I spend my days wishing I could use that newfound focus to make better videos, to become a better artist, to become an artist at all, I'm not even sure I can call this shit art, uh, instead of writing political proposals for days that are only going to end up being rejected anyway. Politics does, of course, matter. Voting does matter. And the change that they affect have a real impact. Maybe in three years time, I could end up in a position of power and actually make some change. But maybe I would end up in the same situation I am in now for another four years. Maybe the election would go great for the left, but instead of forming a left-wing coalition, the larger parties instead make a center coalition instead of with me. That's a lot of maybes, and I'm not made for that. I already have a platform to say whatever it is I want to say to a larger audience than I ever thought I would have. So I'll not be staying in politics. I don't fit well with the fake smiles, the never ending stream of rejections, and the constant flurry of emails from citizens angry at me because I don't change things. I don't have the power to change. That's not to say I have any beef with the politician colleagues that I have. They are wonderful people. Weirdly enough, extraordinarily kind people. I have met politicians from other parties before and they're not as nice as the people in this municipality. Legitimately, I got really lucky having a municipality with a right-wing government, which is actually like weirdly like not dickish. So I don't want it to feel like I'm insulting anyone or had a bad experience in politics because of the people I met. Honestly, I met some of the nicest, kindest people in the world. This video is not a resignation video. This is a I shan't I shan't be running for re-election video after I give up my seat to the Green Party. In the coming year, I'll be going back to making YouTube videos full time again. I thought I could balance both jobs, but as we have seen, I can't. Even with ADHD medication, it turns out you just find more work for yourself to do. I think my biggest obstacle has been the fact that I've been juggling so many different tasks in my mind. I can't wait to just go back to doing this. And I'm looking forward to see what we can do together. But with all of that said, should you vote? If there is one thing that I have learned in my time in politics, it is that politics is not the only way to change the world. If you, like me before the election, believe that voting is the only way to make any material change, or that politics is the way to do that, I want you to know that what you're really doing is you're selling out your own agency to change it as well. If you rely on a government or a state to change the world, there will always be two things you can never really change which is the government and the state. And if you can't change, then what is the point? This trick, this lie is encouraged to you by multiple people, by states, by governments, by political parties, all of which encourage you to follow what they would like you to think. They want you to give them your agency to change the world the way they see fit. And you can do that, but you shouldn't forget that you have the agency yourself in the first place. And you don't have to be reliant on them to tell you how to think. That was fun. 
You're looking forward to wait another four months for another video? Because that's how long these things take now, apparently. At least until I resign. Well, whether you end up trying to make the world a better place in or outside of politics, it's important to stay informed about both what's going on around the world and what other people are talking about. Which leads me very easily into my sponsor for this video, Ground News, who are very kind and gracious with me being perhaps the latest one can possibly be with a video release. Ground News is a platform where you can read the news, but the thing that makes them better than just about any other news page is that you can compare news sources covering the same issue. Every story comes with a quick visual breakdown of the political bias, factuality, and ownership of the sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. One of the worst things you can be when you're involved in any type of politics is to be in a news bubble, when you don't see the same type of news that other people are. Ground News gives you a counter to this by showing you which kinds of news sources cover which stories. And that's a good way to stay informed, but also a good way to test your own bias about which stories are actually important and which ones might just be catered to my interests. Being able to see which news are covered almost exclusively by right or left-wing media encourages me to think more critically about all the news I consume, including locally. You can also compare ownership and factuality between different news sources, and I use it frequently to see if the stories I've seen actually give me a normal, well-rounded view of the news in general. Ground News is a fantastic tool for sifting through the daily misinformation and bias that is everywhere in modern day political discourse. They provide all the tools that you need to be a critical thinker, and I cannot recommend it enough. I believe Ground News is a pretty dang useful resource, which is also why I'm very happy to say that I'm offering 40% off their Vantage subscription. You can only access this discount through my link, so go to ground.news slash MiaMulder or click the link in the video description and support an independent news platform working to make the media landscape a little bit more transparent. Wow, okay. Hey folks, thank you so much for watching this video and thank you so much for being so patient with me as I take apparently longer and longer and longer to make videos. I am very happy with this one though. I thought it was a good one. I thought it was fun. And I had to like cram in editing sessions in the time, like when I don't have council meetings. It's actually like not <laughs> like a great for my mental health, but it's fine. Uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna be better during the year anyway. So it's gonna be fun. Also, uh, future videos are gonna be using like editing teams. So that's gonna also help with all of that kind of stuff. I want to give a special thanks to all of you for being so patient with this video, being so patient with me, like during this time, like I know that I haven't been like the best creator to follow lately. Um, I'm very unreliable, I'm very flaky, I'm very like sloppy. So I, I don't know, like I, I really just appreciate you being here and like supporting me and doing what I do. I, I really, really, really appreciate it. I want to give a special thanks to Linus to help me like learn how to use the editing software. Thank you, Linus. I want to give a special thanks to, of course, the left party, uh, which I think you should vote for. I, I, I don't really talk about that much in the video itself, and I think that that's, that's very much intentional. But, you know, like, I, I like them. But if they decide to, like, never change their mind on the... On some other issues, maybe, maybe, maybe I fight them more internally, but that's a different issue. I also want to give a special thanks to all of my lovely, lovely, lovely patrons who have been more patient than anyone else, uh, considering that I have also been quite flaky in my stressed out mind orb hell, uh, even with like Patreon rewards and stuff like that. So I, I, I'm so thankful and so grateful and so. I, I don't even have I'm 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 gobsmacked. I don't have words, but I do, of course, want to give a special thanks. Uh, well, first of all, to all of you, and an even even more special thanks to Aini Salminen, Aislin, Alexandra Leinbach, Amanda B, Amelia Unchained, Amy Lee, Andy Sophia Fontaine, Angelo Garcia, Angelo Garcia again. Th there are two. Are you are you my patron twice or are are these two people anyway? April, Aster Disaster, Athiet, 
Balaz Vincero, Boar Lover, Catherine, Choices Make Me Anxious, Cobra Sphere, CRT Hayes, Dana Ferguson, Deanna Morandi Araceto, Dominic, Eleanor Cassidy, Emilia Clark, M. Coy, Emma, Erich Owens, Erin Rafferty, Fox Kant, Gwenda Euphoria, Gwendolyn the Middling, Henry R. Seymour, Hyla Tracy, Jane Lesby, Jareth Arnold, Jason Haig, Jill Isabel Jerry, Jonathan Stern, Joshua Analik, Julie Helene, Justin Lowry, Kira Wins IRL, LPQ Silver, Leonard Chavaz, LGBTQIA.space, Linus Tvobuknol, Lucas Gray, Madison, Marcus Smith, Mari Neckar, Matilda, Maurizio, Michaela, Mo Khalifa, Mod Zero, Nir Pasaka, Nicole Daniel, Nuffbun, Paul D. Mackey, Pavel Dubek, Peridot, Perky, Rob Hewlett, Rose Brunton, Zitzries, Sonic Bread, Spaghettisburg Address, Steph Sterling, Taryn and Callie, Taylor Sophia, Thea Vega, Thors of Mir, Travis Siobhan, Valerie Blackbird, Weirdy Beardy, and, of course, Wolfgang, the Grand High Exalted Wizard. Uh, thank you. Esoteric Theory Daddy. <laughs>